Here we are. Proverbs chapter 25. I'll read verse 1 because verse 1 requires an, an introduction, and then we'll move verse by verse through uh, Proverbs. There are going to be times when um, two or three of the verses will be uh, together. Sometimes there'll be just a single verse that we'll look at, but uh, we will be looking at the 25th chapter. So let's begin here at verse 1, Proverbs chapter 25, um, and this is what it reads. Proverbs 25, verse 1. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. And so he's simply saying that these were collected by men during the reign of King Hezekiah. That's, how it, that's what it's saying, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So these men were what are called scribes. The word scribe speaks of a biblical scholar. And the biblical scholars were those who highly valued and highly reverenced the word of God. And these men had taken these proverbs, they had copied them, and they, ha they had preserved them. And that's what verse 1 is referring to when it says, These also are proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Uh, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, uh, reigned from 715 to 686 B.C. And so Solomon was uh, 900 a little over 900, close to 1,000, really, 1,000 B.C. So that tells us that these were Proverbs that they had collected and later on had made um, available for us here in the book of Proverbs. And so these are Proverbs of Solomon. Verse 2 begins with the Proverbs that they had copied. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And so God is glorified because as we search something out, it reveals to us more about God. I, it would be a way of saying instead of us being puffed up with self-importance, when you begin to seek the Lord and seek the things of God that appear to be hidden, and he chooses to reveal those things to you, that the result of searching out and having the revelation given to you instead of producing pride in you, is going to produce humility in you. And one of the ways you can know that someone really has a relationship with the Lord isn't how they begin to point to their library and show you how many books they have. It isn't that they're capable of quoting from the Greek or from the Hebrew. Those are great things if you can do that. But the true measure of an individual who knows the Lord isn't that they're puffed up with their knowledge and self-importance. The true measure of someone who knows the Lord and is serving the Lord is the depth of their humility. And the depth of their humility comes because they're searching out the Lord. And as the closer they get to the Lord, the more of themselves they see. And the more they learn of the Lord and his wisdom, the more aware of they are of their own ignorance, and so that's how it works. And so it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. So there are mysteries that God will conceal, but he is willing to reveal, sometimes reveal those things to those who are willing to search. We need to remember that he's the one who decides what to reveal, and he is also the one who decides what he wants to conceal. In Deuteronomy, in chapter 29, verse 29, it, it reads, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There are some things that are secret that belong only to him. It's the mystery of his will but there are other things that he chooses to reveal to us. And so when you search those things out and he reveals them to us, they're so that we might be blessed. Not only us, but that we might take those things and communicate them to our children and our children's children. So what God has thought proper to reveal, he has revealed. But the things he has not revealed concern God alone. And interestingly enough, it's been put, these are not to be inquired after. One of the things, and I'll say this briefly, I didn't prepare notes for this, so I'll just say this briefly. The word occult, we've all heard the word occult. 
not cult, occult. Uh, the word occult speaks of hidden things. And the practice of occultism is the searching out hidden things. And so people try to search out hidden things through occult measures. So they'll go to a Ouija board, they go to tarot cards, they may go to a, a seance, or go to somebody who purports to uh, have a communication with the other side or whatever. And uh, that's called occultism. And so that is strictly forbidden in Scripture. You're not to inquire in that way. You're not to go to what are called necromancers, those who say that they're speaking to the dead and all of that. Why? Because the secret things belong to the Lord. Because there are things that God has chosen to hide from man. And so in attempting to get information by, uh, you know, consulting uh, somebody who is a spiritist, medium, or whatever, strictly forbidden by the Lord. So there are things that he has chosen to hide from us. There are other things that he will reveal, but it requires on our part a diligence of searching. Because sometimes people may say, well, I'm really interested in what God's will for me is. And so you say, have you been reading the word? Oh, no. What are you expecting him to do for you then? Send you, a, you know, an email, become one of your, you know, send a Facebook friend request. What do you want him to do for you? Uh, because he's revealed to you the things that are necessary, and those things are, are here in Scripture. But even as they're revealed, there's something else that you might find interesting, and that is they may be there in front of you, but it takes a searching out prayerfully so that the Lord may, through his Spirit, reveal to you what it is that is concealed there. So there are things that he intends for us to know, but it requires a diligence on our part as we seek those things out. In Romans 11, verse 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And so there are things that he will reveal, but he chooses to do that. We seek, but he reveals. Now, notice how it says, again, it is the glory of kings to search out a matter. So that enables the king to judge properly because as he is searching out whatever this matter may be, he gets enough information to make proper judgment. So the spiritual application can be hungry seekers after the Lord will be satisfied. Jesus said it in Matthew 7, verse 7, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. So do you want to know the will of the Lord? Seek him. Seek him through the word of God and prayer. He reveals himself to you. If there are things that you're wanting to know and he says it's none of your business, you'll find that out really quickly also. And he sometimes does say that, doesn't he? Verse 3, as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Uh, interestingly enough, often decisions are not understood by, uh, by people. In other words, why was that decision made? Often decisions are not understood by people uh, for a variety of reasons. There are people who will wonder, how come you came to that conclusion? Why did you make that decision? It happens in church. It happens in life in general. They want to know why somebody in charge or somebody has made a decision, and, and they'll wonder why those decisions were made. And they want an explanation. They'll come up and they'll say, can you please explain to me why you did this? And there are times that, that you, you can't really give a good explanation to some. Um, there are times that a person has who's asking really isn't, isn't able to understand the reasons that will be given for those decisions being made. Um, the person who made the decision may have a greater understanding of the situation. Or they may ask, how come you decided to do this or that? And that person uh, that had made that decision uh, can't really give all the information because there are certain confidences that have been, uh, you know, that, that you have sworn yourself to, if you will. There are times, that, in other words, that people have approached me and they've said, I need to ask for some advice, but I'd like to make sure this is confidential. Can you make sure that you don't share this with anybody? You know, and there are times when you need to keep those confidences and all. And so somebody may come up to you and say, how come, uh, well, you can't really give, you can't disclose, you can't say, because you, you have a confidence that you're keeping. So there are people who will want to know why you do certain things, and you're not always able to give the, um, the, the answer to that. 
There are times when the Holy Spirit is leading you in a way that that you couldn't explain even if you tried. You you know that the Spirit is saying, this is what you need to do. And uh, and people will say, that makes absolutely no sense. And and you'll agree with them. You'll say, you know, (laughs) that's true. But I I know that the Spirit of the Lord is saying, we need to go in this direction right now. That's what we're going to do. And then lo and behold... Uh, the Lord comes through in a beautiful way, and then the people will understand why you did what you did. And so, as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of a king is unsearchable, there are times that decisions are made that aren't understood by the people. Verse 4, take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. So dross is impurity. So he says, take away the dross from silver. He's speaking of removing impurity. And so on the one hand, you take away the dross from silver, it's purified, and it becomes something you can use, you know, from silver, it can become jewelry. But it's interesting how he goes on in verse 5 to say, take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. And and here, it's speaking about um, impurities being removed uh, from government. Boy, can we pray for that, can't we? But when impurities are removed, he's saying government can perform its duties. Remember in Romans 13, if you take notes, it's found in verses 3 and 4 of Romans 13, how the apostle Paul said this. He said, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You know, you're driving down the street, and as you're driving down the street, you may be listening to music, probably listening to one of my teachings or something. But as you're you're driving down the street, and you're kind of lost in whatever world it is, you're still conscious enough to drive, but you're thinking of something else, right? And you happen to look in your rearview mirror and you see a patrol car behind you. What do you do? What's the first thing you do? I heard someone say, slow down. That means you're a habitual speeder. That's one. What else do you do? (laughs) Put that paper bag down under the seat. What do you do? You know, the average person does. The average person looks at their speedometer. I do. I do. And I try to keep the law, and I'm not pretending to be perfect. But I, I, I do. My, my first response is look at the speedometer. If Marie's driving, first thing I do is, is I hide underneath the... Because <laughs> I know we're going to get pulled over. No, I mean, why? Why do we do that? We do that because we have an awareness that government is there to enforce laws. And we have an awareness that we can possibly break that law, sometimes without thinking about it. But what is it reflecting to us? It's reflecting that we have a, a, a fear of law enforcement. That's what it shows. It says here, though, rulers hold no terror for those who do right. So one of the things that I'm trying to learn to do, and as I just admitted, you know, I do look at my speedometer or whatever, If I come to a stop sign, you know, and I roll through, and I usually don't, I have to say that, but I do make sure I stop. Why? Because I know I can get a ticket, and I don't want to get a ticket. It's just what it is. And so rulers hold no terror for those who do right. So if you habitually going within the framework of the speed limit, if you're stopping and stop saying things of that nature, there's no reason why you should be afraid. So he says, they hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. And then he asks the question, do you want to be free from fear of one who's in authority? And then do what is right. He'll actually commend you, for he is God's servant to to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword for nothing. And then this is the interesting phrase, he is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on a wrongdoer. Interesting, isn't it? And so, in the scripture here, righteousness is important in government. Remove impurity, and the government will function in a better way. 
verse 6 and 7. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king. Do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. That's very practical. Don't exalt yourself. This is a call to humility. Promoting yourself, he's saying, runs the risk of public humiliation. Now, if you've lived in the shadow of somebody, this desire to exalt yourself, this desire to be known can be a strong temptation. You may be thinking, I've been, you know, I've been walking in this person's shadow for a long time. I really ought to do something to get some attention. They really ought to show their appreciation to me. I come in on time. I stay even late sometimes. I take, you know, 10-minute break. I take a 10-minute break, 30-minute lunch. I take a 30-minute lunch. I'm a good worker. Why don't they show any attention to me? How come these other people are always getting promotions or getting commendations and employee of the month or employee of the week and all of that. And you can get upset at that. You can get so mad that you, you want the attention. You'll do almost anything to get it. He's saying, don't exalt yourself. You need to just do your job, in other words. Instead of promoting yourself, do your job, do your work, and trust the Lord because exaltation comes from him ultimately. Jesus used this, by the way, this, this uh, biblical concept in his own teachings in Luke chapter 14. In verses 8 through 10, he said this. Jesus said, when you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you'll have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. Instead of running in saying, that's the chief seat. That's where I want to sit. Just, just take a lower seat. Let me see. I was asked to speak somewhere a while back now. And so Marie and I went and a couple of my, my kids. And they had reserved seats there so we could sit in the front because I was going to get up and teach. And it's just easier for me to get up from the front. And that's why they do that. It's not because I'm so special, though I am. But, <laughs> but they'll see me. I'll be sitting in the back. No, I, so I, I come and I... I sit there, right? Marie's seated there, and my kids. And a lady comes, and she comes and begins to sit next to me, and I, I, I'm, just, I'm just aghast. That's all I am, so I'm just seated there. But an usher walks up to her. She's an older lady. When I say older, she's older than me. She's an older lady. <laughs> so... <laughs> so the usher says, I'm sorry, ma'am, but... That's reserved seating. And she says, oh, so she moves over to another seat. And he says, no, I'm sorry, this, this whole row is reserved seating. She gets mad. So she's, she's mad. And she, she talks to me. She looks at me. She goes, how come this is reserved seating? I go, I don't know. Thanks for the welcome. No, I said, I, don't, I, said, I don't know. I I, I don't, I said, Marie, Marie hit her. No, I, I go, <laughs> help me, mommy. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, she got really angry as if I had chosen to be seated there and then told everybody else, you can't sit here. You're not good enough to sit next to me, right? It's odd how people want to have certain seats. But what made it even more ironically, almost humor, humorous in a way, but it's really not, was she sat, they sat her directly behind us. So she's seated right behind me, and she's mad. I mean, she's muttering and sputtering as she walks away. And you could hear her as she's taking her seat. She was not a happy camper at all. She was so mad. 
don't understand this. The minute worship started, all of a sudden her hands are between Marie and me, like to the Lord praising God. And I'm thinking, girl, <laughs> you were so mad a minute ago. And here you are just taking these dirty hands to God. Unbelievable. <laughs> so be, in the scripture says we're to pray lifting up holy hands. And they become polluted by sin. We need to remember that. And so, listen, be very careful that you, you don't fall into the temptation of needing to be honored before men. Be careful with that because the Lord is good. He will humble you, and you will be placed in the lower seat. Just make a habit of just walking in humility. God will bless you in that. And so be careful about that. Verse 8, do not go hastily to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor and do not disclose the secret to another, lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation is ruined. So what this is calling for is discretion. Do not eagerly reveal what you have seen secretly. Under cross-examination, your own character will be openly revealed. That can apply not only in court, but it can apply to private quarrels. What you reveal can bring humiliation to you. So don't reveal private information to clear yourself in an argument. There are things you may know that are not meant for others to become aware of, and be careful about that. Verse 11. This is an interesting, this is an interesting proverb. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. Now, that's really interesting. So when it says first, uh, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold, I, I think apples of gold. Now, what would that be referring to? Well, one of the commentators was pointing out that often carvings that they would have would be, um, you know, on pillars could be, um, you know, apples that were painted gold. And so it's really a, a, a beautiful carving that is referred to. So a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. It's just it's decorative and it's beautiful. That's the point that he's making. But it goes on to, to, to help us to understand that a well-constructed saying or a piece of advice has value. And what is interesting to me in verse 12 is like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Oh, a wise rebuker. Not just somebody who likes to rebuke. Because, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we might get into this, this idea that God has appointed us to rebuke everybody. And there are some who really feel that that is, that's their ministry. I was teaching at a pastor's conference on one occasion and gave a, a general teaching and all. It was in another state. And, and a young man approached me after the study, and he walks up to me, and he says, there's something like this. I didn't memorize it, but I do remember in general what he said because it was so interesting. He said to me, you know your study that you just gave? I said, yeah. He goes, it wasn't that good. <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right about that. No, it wasn't that good. I said, okay. He goes, you know, I have the ministry of rebuking teachers to keep you humble. And there are people who actually think that way. They really do. They're, they're going to make sure that you don't have a proud attitude. They're going to make sure. So they'll come and let you know how stupid you are. The funny thing is, is you already feel that anyway. So it's not like you're going to go, oh, I, I was feeling smart. Now I feel stupid. It, it, that doesn't happen. And so rebuke is a good thing if it's done with a right attitude. 
and, uh, and a correction. The word rebuke can speak of correction. A correction is good, especially good, when there's someone who's open to receive it, because when you are open to receive proper correction, your life improves. It really does. It, when you have a humble spirit, when you realize you haven't arrived, when you know there's a lot that you need to learn, I'm telling you, when someone with a, with a wise spirit, somebody who's loving and caring, and they're not coming to, you know, exercise their ministry of rebuking, rebuking people, but rather as they're there because they love you and they encourage you and they bring correction. Thank God for those people. You know, when you read the, the book of Acts, there's a young man, his name is Apollos. Apollos was learned in the scriptures and extremely eloquent. He was so, so learned, so, so well-schooled in Bible and such a beautiful speaker that he actually was used to, um, in comparison to the apostle Paul himself. And uh, they would say Paul is very dull in the way he speaks. But there were those who would say Apollos has, has just an eloquence and a depth to him and and all and and, and I, I I like this young man Apollos. And when you read about him in the book of Acts, you'll see something about him that made him a great man. And that is this: that he was sharing. And as he was sharing, there were two older people there, a man named Aquila, his wife Priscilla, and they were listening to him as Apollos was sharing. And again, you need to understand this is a very eloquent man, a very intelligent man, a very learned man. And Aquila and Priscilla were not necessarily in the same intellectual plane as this man but they'd been walking with the Lord longer than Apollos. And as they were listening to him speak, they knew that he was giving information, but not with any depth or complete accuracy. He was giving some basic things, and he spoke well about those things, but he needed a more full understanding of the message of the gospel. And, and, and Luke records how, how that Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and more carefully gave to him understanding and teaching in Scripture. And Apollos, to his credit, listened to these old people who were not as scholarly as he, who most certainly weren't as eloquent as he, but he listened to them, and he became one of the prince of preachers in the New Testament. It's wise to listen to correction. It's wise to hear of those from those who know. As a pastor... You know, I've been at this for a long time, for a long time. You know, I, I, I had a young man correcting me, and I mentioned to a friend of mine, he said, yeah, a young guy was talking to me, and he looked at, and, and was bringing some correction to me. We were just talking. I wasn't whining or crying. I was just sharing about it. And my friend looks at me, and he says, you have Bibles that are older than him. And I said, that's true. That's true. But you're wise if you listen. You're wise if you're correctable because God will bring a word of correction sometimes uh, from the mouth of somebody that you normally wouldn't even want to hear from. I mean, you've got a man named Balaam who had a donkey who spoke to him. He still uses donkeys, and I have to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. And so it's wise. Listen, if somebody brings a word of correction to you and they're not being unkind, they're speaking a word that is like he says in verse 11, fitly spoken, a proper word. It is a great thing to receive so that your life can be changed. Like an earring of gold, an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. Somebody who can hear and their life can change because the obedient ear will benefit from good advice. Verse 13, like the cold of snow in time of harvest, is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. So simply put, a faithful messenger is refreshing, but notice, is refreshing to the one who sent them out. Why is that? Because faithfulness is always refreshing. And Jesus is blessed when we are faithful messengers. And if we're going to be a faithful messenger, taking his message out, then we need to take time to know that message. And we need to give it out as we understand it. And as we do so, that's a refreshing that takes place. 
Now, Paul is a good example of someone who was refreshed. He was refreshed by a young man named Timothy. And Timothy was what is called a faithful messenger. And Paul speaks of him in Philippians in chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, when he says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. You can't imagine how refreshed the soul of Paul would be to know that he had a young man like Timothy taking out the message. This is a man who loved him like a son loves his dad, and his soul was refreshed in that way. Verse 14, whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. Well, all you need to do is, well, I was going to say go to Israel, but no, just go outside. Uh, How hot and dry our climate can be. So in a dry climate, rain is a blessing. But sometimes when rain is needed, you can look look up and see dark clouds that have, like it's threatening to rain and all. That actually can produce a false hope, especially if you're a farmer in need of rain. So he's saying a person who is pretending to have been generous but in fact was not is simply lying. And sometimes they will pretend to give to gain attention, but ultimately they disappoint because they're not really giving at all. So whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. False promises and only disappointment occurs. Verse 15. By long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded. A gentle tongue breaks a bone. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? By long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded. Submission coupled with calm and patient speech can overcome initial opposition. You may have an idea that you're trying to present to somebody, somebody that matters to you, whether it's a boss or even in a relationship, and and you're trying to share some things and, and all because you know it'll be a good idea if it's, if, it's, if it's embraced and all, but you have initial opposition. No, I, I'm not going to do that. There's no way I'm going to do that. Well, if you're calm and patient and all and continue to present uh, this, um, sometimes you can persuade that person. You see, when it says uh, a gentle tongue breaks a bone, um, that's, that's a way of saying um, a, a bone, uh, this broken bone and all. It, it's a picture of strong opposition. And so there are times when patience overcomes strong opposition. And instead of being insistent and angry and threatening, you simply calmly persuade. You calmly say, no, that this is a, a good idea. I'd like you to consider this. Think about it. Pray about it. Let's see what the Lord says to you. But instead of getting angry and, and wanting to make your point, it's always wise to just be patient and, uh, and calm. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 1, remember it says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Harsh word, a harsh word stirs up anger. Verse 16, have you found honey? Yeah, she's sitting right here in front of me. No, have you? Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. (laughs) Okay, what is that saying? Uh, It's possible to have too much of a good thing. I don't know how many people in this room were raised in the Roman Catholic uh, faith. I was. And during Lent... Um, you were to give something up, and I gave up candy because you're supposed to give up something that you really like. And at that time, when I was eight years old, I liked uh, I liked my sweets and candy and all of that. So you give it up for the duration of Lent. And then finally, when Lent is over, you're able to have whatever it is that you gave up. And I still remember that I had given up candy and Lent is over, and now I can eat. And my mom and my dad knew that I had given up candy for Lent, so they gave me enough to go out and buy a lot of candy. 
And I went and I bought all this candy and I just ate it up. All these wrappers were all over on the ground. I don't like candy anymore. <laughs> I, I eat very little candy because as I ate it, I got sick of it. I understand what this is saying here. Eat only as much as you need lest you be filled with it and vomit. There's, there's such a thing as having too much of a good thing, in other words. So moderation is necessary if you're going to have pleasure in life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 says it like this, Let your moderation be known unto all men. So moderation is a good thing. Verse 17, here's an interesting one too. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> hey, I'm here. Are you doing anything? Yeah, put the, you know, put, we used to say put the pot on, put, not the pot, but put the, <laughs> we said that too, but, but coffee, <laughs> Put the coffee pot on. That was a phrase that was used a long time ago because that's when you used to have what they called percolators or whatever. So that was a phrase that was used. My mom would use, put the pot on, which meant she's coming over for coffee, right? It's an old saying. You know, but let's face it, you know, it's not always nice to have a neighbor who comes when they're uninvited. You know, you, you're doing whatever you're doing. You're cleaning or relaxing or watching a program. You know, and then you hear a knock on the door. And, uh, you know, the first time you go, oh, hi, how are you? Are you doing anything? Oh, well, I'm always doing something. I mean, come on. I mean, if you ask me that, are you doing anything? Yeah, I'm doing something. Even if I'm napping, I'm doing something. Yeah, I'm doing something. But, you know, you're polite. So you say, well, come on. No, 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 you lie. No, come on in. You know, no, fine. Oh, you know, I don't want to bother you. I was just, they'll come in. And that's just nothing wrong with that. I mean, hi, how are you? What you up to and this and that, right? Then they come over the next day. Hi, not doing anything? <laughs> so it's true. After a while, if people come uninvited, they overstay their welcome. And so don't wear out your welcome. Don't make frequent uninvited visits. Good, good wisdom. Good wisdom. Just don't just be dropping over. Give them a call. And let them know. And, uh, and uh, I mean, have you ever heard someone knock on the door and then you kind of look through the side curtain there and you say to your wife, stop breathing? <laughs> <laughs> it's your parents. No. <laughs> anyway, verse 18. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Interesting, false witness. Notice with me that a club, sword, and arrow are deadly weapons. So he's saying a false witness is a deadly weapon. Why? Because a false witness can cause harm, even death, to innocent people. In Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And it's interesting because when the word neighbor is used, a neighbor is a person um, who is around you, whether he's a, a, a friend or even an enemy. You're not to bear false witness. Verse 19, this is another. These, I like these, these parables. They're very, these proverbs rather, they're very um, descriptive. They're very creative. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. We understand that to some degree, don't we? Yeah. Trusting an unreliable and faithless person is painful, is frustrating, and is fruitless. And that's true. Hey, I'll be there. I promise you, I'll be there. Are you sure? I'll be there. Man, you can count on me. I got your back, man. I'll be there. And you're waiting for them. It's 6 o'clock. They're supposed to come and help you. It's 6.30. They haven't shown up. It's 7. They haven't shown up. It's 8. It's 9. They never show up. You call them up. Oh, man, I'm sorry, bro. I was going to be there. I was going to be there, but I got hung up. What did you get hung up on, man? I was sleeping, you know. <laughs> and so trusting an unreliable and faithless person is painful. And that's the point he's making. And if there's anything we as believers ought to be, it's we ought to be faithful. 
Uh, Matthew 5, 37, Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Have integrity, in other words. Verse 20, like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. That's, well, one, these kinds of things are counterproductive. Uh, taking a garment in cold weather, vinegar on soda, that's, that's not something you want to do. They're inappropriate things to do. But here's something for us, and I'll take just a moment to share a little bit about this. This is a real important and very practical thing, and hopefully I'll be able to share in a way that it makes some sense. When he said, like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda, which is inappropriate, that's inappropriate, that's the point, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Listen, one of the things that the church doesn't do well sometimes is we don't know how to grieve with the ones who are grieving. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we say inappropriate things. See, the word inappropriate is what it's being referred to when it speaks about taking away a garment in cold weather. That's a wrong thing to do. And putting vinegar on soda, that's just not something you do. So someone is singing songs to someone with a broken heart? I'm telling you, sometimes believers, and, I, and, and, and they're my brothers and my sisters, and they, they don't mean harm, and I know that. But sometimes there have been things that are said that were better left unsaid. A, a, a young woman is pregnant and she miscarries and, and, and her friends or sister, family, whatever, want to bring cheer to her. They want her to know they're with her, right? But I have heard it more than once where they'll say something, and they're trying to cheer them up, but they'll say, don't worry, honey, you're young. You'll get pregnant again. That's the wrong thing to say. That's the wrong thing to say. You know, when, uh, when Job's friends just came and sat next to him and said nothing for all those days, that's the best thing they could have done because they were knowing what Paul said when Paul said, weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And sometimes out of our, our heart to see people well and to see them healed, we may say something to them that instead of helping them to heal, it hurts them even deeper. Don't worry, baby, it's okay. You know, your husband left you. That's all right, baby. God's got a better one for you. How do you know? How do you know? How do I know? You know, I, 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 I tried to learn a long time ago, and I especially think that, the longer you're in ministry, the, the more you learn. Um, sometimes you just don't have the answer for them, and you just don't even try. I've, I, I've, I, I, I have had people, perhaps there's some maybe right here right now that I've said this to, but because I've said it more than once, because someone will share with me a, a broken, something that, that they're broken about, and I will say to them, I have never experienced that. I can't even imagine what you're feeling. I just can't. I can't imagine. But my heart's with you. And, and, and I'll pray for you. And, and may God help you in this. And sometimes, I, and I, I, I think I can say this, and I don't want it to be indelicate, but I'm, I'm trying to be practical. Um, I, I can remember many years ago, many years ago, a young woman approaching me, and I'm talking 30-plus years ago now, approaching me and, and saying to me that, that she had been raped. And, and my heart went out to her and, and as a young man, and I'm trying to learn how to minister and, and I, can, I can do so much. I can help her in so much. But I thought of a, a woman whom I know who had gone through the same thing. So I said to the young lady, honey, I, I, I didn't say, honey, I was too young to do it then. At my age, I can say honey now. At that point, I said, baby. No, I said, um, <laughs> no, I said, you know, I, 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 know, I, I know somebody who understands, understands in a way that you would appreciate. And I said, would you mind 
if I ask her to spend some time with you? Because she can relate with you, and God has healed her. And this young lady said, please. And I spoke to this woman who spoke to her, connected them, and this woman who had gone through the same pain was able to help her navigate to healing. See, so you need to have wisdom. You, ha you need to be wise. You, 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 don't, you don't try and just, you know, all things work for good to those who love God. That, that's true. But when someone's walking through the valley of the shadow of death and they're feeling alone, it's important for you to just walk silently with them and to pray for them. You know you can pray quietly as you walk. You can. And, and, and they may turn to you, and this I'm telling you after all these, I'm just telling you, they will turn to you and they will say, thank you for just listening. Thank you for your heart. Because you can cry with those who cry. And sometimes crying with someone is what they need right now. That's true. Am I, am I wrong? I don't think so. Sometimes crying with someone when they're crying is what they need right now. That's not a lack of faith. That's called compassion. That's called empathy. That's called loving them. Because they don't need a pep talk sometimes, guys. They know scripture, sometimes the same ones you're going to give to them. What they need is a friend who will walk with them and walk through with them. They will get to the other side. My God is good. He will bring them through. But it's always nice to have somebody with you who's not singing songs to you when you've got a broken heart. And that's what the proverb is telling us. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather, like vinegar on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. There are times when you just don't say anything. There are times when you just pray for them. Sometimes when you just pray. Let's see. Where am I now? Verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Ooh, the first time I read that, I said, all right. You know, we'll just burn in coals and burn them up. I get it. No, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, this is one of those verses with a general principle. The general principle is do good to those who are unkind or even hate you. If your enemy is hungry, do good to those who hate you. Uh, this is repeated, by the way, in Romans 12, verses 20 and 21, where Paul said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, what is he referring to when he's speaking about uh, heaping coals of fire on his head? One commentator pointed out that in ancient Egypt, when someone demonstrated shame and guilt, they would publicly carry a pan of burning coals on their head. And that was to represent the pangs of conscience that burned his heart. So when you love an enemy, you actually shame him for his hatred towards you. So it's a way of bringing him to humility. It's a way of bringing him to a place of repentance. You're heaping coals of fire on his head. Verse 23, the north wind brings forth rain and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. That's an interesting one too. Uh, what is he saying? Well, if you're gossiping about somebody and they hear you, they give you a dirty look for when you're backbiting them. You know, and there are times when people may be saying things they don't know the person can hear them. And they're saying, well, you know, they're okay, but, you know, look at the way they're dressed right now. Look at their hair, you know, or whatever. And the person's right there, and then they hear you, and they, they will give you a withering look. And that's basically what he's saying. A backbiting tongue produces an angry countenance. Somebody's looking at them angrily. Here's a good one. Verse 24. <laughs> It is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a contentious woman. I don't have to say anything. 
Peaceful solitude is better than strife-filled companionship. That's a gentle way to say it, isn't it? And we'll just leave it there. I've already, he, Solomon obviously had some contentious women in his life. He keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Verse 25, as cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. Good news. Good news is refreshing. Good news coming from a far country is refreshing. Well, you can, you can apply this, and I'll, I'll apply it in this way. Um, missions, when you go out and you take the word of God to people who have yet to hear the gospel, missions can bring refreshment to the thirsty and those with dry hearts. In Revelation 22, uh, 17, the scripture says, The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. We are dry and thirsty. We're walking through a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Uh, if, if you have a chance, if you haven't already gone to Israel, if you ever have a chance to go to Israel, you'll see this. You'll understand. You know, I'll be honest with you. One of the reasons that I, that I value trips to Israel is for so many practical reasons. And you'll read a lot of scripture that speaks about dry and thirsty lands or barren lands or wilderness. You read that a lot in scripture. And you see a lot of incidents, the, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, Jesus being tempted as he's in the wilderness. And we don't have a clue what the wilderness really is. Then you go to Israel and you see it. And one of the things about the, the, um, the uh, weather conditions in Israel, it's a, it is a very dry place. And so when you go to Israel, what you do is you will actually have, uh, on the bus, you'll have a uh, re refrigerator that is filled with water. And your guide will say, make sure you carry water with you wherever you go. Why? Because you will dehydrate. You will dehydrate. And me, I'm not a water drinker. I'm not somebody. My wife, Marie, is. I'm not a water drinker. She's always giving me water, saying, you need to drink. You know, she's a water drinker. I don't hydrate. And I should. When I'm in Israel, I do. And I'll tell you why. I have gotten headaches in Israel because you dehydrate very quickly and very easily. So a person in Israel knows what's being said here about water coming to somebody who's very thirsty because you're dehydrated, you're in need of rehydration. And, and so our soul is pictured often as being in a wilderness that it's dry. And so water needs to be given to it so it's refreshed. And what is the way to bring refreshment to a soul? It's the word of God, the water of life the word of God. And so in a practical way, cold water to a weary soul, good news from far country, it's easy to practically apply this one. We can say, yes, that's true. Somebody's dry. Somebody from a distant land comes and gives them good news. And yeah, that's great. But also in a spiritual way, we're walking through a dry and thirsty land. And somebody has come and given us the water of life. We're like that woman at the well that Jesus gave the water of life to. We're like those people um, at, the, uh, at the great day of the feast, as is recorded in John 7, 37 through 39, where, where they're about to pour water from the pool of Siloam into the altar. And, and it's a time of celebration, and they're about to pour that water. And, and people are crying out, saying uh, to the priest, don't spill it, don't spill it. Not a drop is to be spilled as he's about to put this water in a spout that's on the side of the altar to make a water uh, offering, if you will. And, and then Jesus stands up at that moment and says, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. As the scripture says, out of his valley shall flow rivers of living water. What is living water? When you go to Israel, you know, you go with these spiritual ideas, living water. Jesus says he'll give us living water. You know what living water is? Your guide will tell you, you want to know what living water is? And you'll go, nah, I already know I'm so spiritual. No, you'll say, yeah, what? It's water you can drink. That's living water. It's water you can drink. There's water you can't drink. It's stagnant. It's putrid. It's got amoeba. It's got pollution. That's not living water. Living water is water you can drink. 
Living water is water that you can drink because it helps to keep your life. Jesus said, you're going to the land of dryness. And any of the waters that you've attempted to drink from will not satisfy your thirst. If any man drinks of this water, he will thirst again, Jesus said. That water will not satisfy your thirst. And you know that because you've tried it. You've tried to drink the water of whatever, whether it's entertainment, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's relationship. You've tasted of that water. I drank of that water. But he who drinks of this water will thirst again because I discovered that when I did my drugs, when you take the drug, you know, that's one thing. But there's got to be something that gets me a little more high than this. So, you know, they, they have this big argument today. Oh, marijuana is not a gateway drug. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I don't know a single person, and maybe somebody in this room who used to do drugs before you got saved, maybe, maybe you're that person I haven't met yet. I have never met anybody who only smoked pot. They have always gone from pot to something different, something else. I started with alcohol, and then I smoked pot. Then I took THC. Then I took magic mushroom. Then I took acid. I mean, you just progress. You just keep moving. Why? Because, you know, I tried that. It's okay. But I want something different. So I'll try that. That's what I'm talking about. That's the water that you get from the world. It never quenches your thirst. It never does. It only leaves you more thirsty. And then Jesus Christ gives you the water of life, and you never thirst again. I am so satisfied in Jesus Christ because he gave me water that quenched my thirst. And so, yes, cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. Because when you drink of that water, you have life. Verse 26, a righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. Dirty spring, polluted well. Well, this is unforgivable in an area that requires clean drinking water. So he's saying, when righteous people compromise to gain favor, it causes people to lose heart. That's true. When you have somebody that you hold in high esteem and they compromise, breaks your heart. Breaks your heart. Because, let's face it, it's easy to compromise in this day and age if you think it's going to get you something you really want. So we need to hold fast to what is true and not compromise. Verse 27, again, it is not good to eat much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glory. That's an interesting phrase. It's dishonorable for you to seek your own glory. Proverbs 27, verse 2 says it well. Let another man praise you, not your own mouth. A stranger, not your own lips. Don't brag about yourself. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I have anybody in this room who, who boasts about themselves. Um, I'm going to assume that, that you don't, and I, I, I don't think you do. Because if I thought somebody in here was doing it, I'd probably use a different illustration. Bragger. But um, is there anything less attractive than somebody who has to tell you how good they are about at something. It just is very unattractive. It's very unattractive. Let somebody else's lips praise you. There's plenty of people who can see the good that's going on in your life, and they'll tell others about it. And don't ever do anything to get attention from others. That is just not a good habit to get into. It's not a good habit. You can become addicted to the praise of men, and when you get addicted to the praise of men, you're going to do about anything you can to be praised by men. So make sure that the things you do are for the Lord, not for attention from somebody else. Make sure that you do it with pure heart so that God, who sees it in secret, is the one who rewards you openly. But when you go out and you're looking for attention, it's just not a good thing. And finally, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. When he speaks of not ruling your own spirit, it's one who's lacking self-control. And he's saying the one who lacks self-control has no defenses. 
They don't have anything exterior, nor do they have any interior restraint. If you don't rule your own spirit, you're defenseless. And so this is speaking about self-control. In Galatians 5, 22 and 20 through 25, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If you want to pray for anything, my encouragement right now as we close, pray for self-control. Because we're living in an era where there's just really little self-restraint. In, in the book of Genesis, it speaks of a time when people did that which was right in their own sight. And every thought and intent of the heart was only evil continually. And people were constantly going about doing what they desired to do. And one of the evidences of a person who is not ruled by the Spirit of God is that they have no self-control. And so they're the ones who will take their cards and just charge them up because, after all, I can do that. And they're irresponsible with things in life. Self-restraint is a very important thing. It's important with your finances. It's important in your relationships. When you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, self-restraint is a very important thing to exercise because especially in a day and age when people think it's very natural for you just to have sex whenever you want, whether you're married or not, self-control is an evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to have an internal wall, if you will, we need to have rule over our own spirit. That comes to the power of the Holy Spirit and decisions of the will. That I'm going to live a life that is controlled by the Spirit. So if I walk in the Spirit, I will not yield to the lust of my flesh. And I can live a life that is honoring to God. And rather than being impulsive and doing what I feel like doing right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Lord to help me to not yield to my compulsiveness and to learn to live a disciplined life. And one last thought. When I was young, I was very impulsive. I would do what I felt like doing when I felt like doing it, and I didn't care about the consequences. And I carried that into my Christian life. I didn't realize that my impulsive just doing what I want right now, who cares, was actually not honoring to the Lord. And I finally got married. And when I got married, I was also in ministry, and my whole life changed from being an impulsive person to a planning person because I learned that if I was always doing things by impulse, that I was going to pay the consequences later on. The very first, I'll use one illustration and close, the very first uh, credit card that I ever had. I never had a credit card. Marie and I got married. We didn't have a credit card. We finally got a credit card. I'd never had a credit card, and I got one, and it's close to Christmas. So I'm thinking, man, I can buy Christmas gifts and pay them off. And I only had a $2,000 limit, and, and I went to the limit, $2,000. And then when you make your minimum payment, I would still be paying for it, making minimum payment. And I believe our interest was like 15 to 18%. And so it was unbelievably, on my part, stupid to do that. And so Marie was driving with the kids one day, and our car caught on fire. And it burned up in the middle of Foothill right by, by where was it, Mama Euclid? By Euclid and Foothill. The, the car burned up. It was a car that I would have thrown away. It was bad. That's why Marie drove it. No, it was a bad. <laughs> it was a, it, it, we had 139,000 miles on it. I, I hadn't changed the tires on it until it had 100,000 miles. I had never even rotated it. I knew nothing about taking care of cars. And so I said, what's this wire coming out? Oh, wow, the tires need to be changed. And so my kids learned to to write on the back seats of it. They would take the little pens and scribble, and I had said, this, this car is a mess. we got to get rid of it. Well, it caught on fire, and the insurance paid it off. I wouldn't have given you $10 for that car. They gave me $2,000, actually more than that, a little more than that. And with that money, I paid off 
my credit cards. My one card paid it off, and I have not gone into debt since then. That's, that's been 36, 37, more than 37 years ago. I said, no, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to be unwise in my credit. My dad had taught me something I learned the hard way. My dad said, there are a couple things you need to safeguard, son, and one is your reputation. And your reputation is wrapped up with your credit. Make sure you have good credit. And somebody was just telling me, this sounds like a boast, forgive me. I should let another man praise me and not my own <laughs> mouth. But my, my, my Marie just told me the other day, Marie was just saying that, that our credit is the best credit that these people have ever seen. Because we make sure, and I, I commend my wife who takes care of this, uh, we make sure that every bill that we have is paid before it's time to pay. We've been doing that for years. And my credit's 800 and something. It's way up there. Because that's what we do. Why? Because I want to make sure that I live honorably with integrity and I make sure that these things are done. That's how it works. That's how it works. Don't be impulsive. Be somebody who plans things out, does them right. It ultimately brings honor and glory to God.